thine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is this is the West Allis Observer, which is profiling the 10th annual Reclaiming Our Heritage event. During war times, the sweet singing of a spiritual song often provided the only comfort a soldier could find. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching. Once the song was concluded, it was back to the work of firing the cannons. With a lesson in the effort it took to mount a cannon attack, here representing the 10th Wisconsin is Ken Monroe. The cannon is a six pound cannon. Used, it was built in the 1849 through 1865. It was used extensively through the, the Mexican War. Then when the Civil War came on, it was used probably the first year or so during the, uh, the Civil War for the Union. But because of being not that much uh, firepower, they used it a lot. Uh, it was usually melted down, and they made 12-pound Napoleons out of them. The Confederates, they would use a six-pounder because they didn't have much choice. The firing, you'd have uh, eight men. You'd have the number one man, number two, three, and four. You'd have a number seven and eight man, and a number five man. The number one man, he would be the, the gentleman that would swab the bore. Number two, he would be the gentleman that would uh, extract anything that was in the, the bore after the firing. Number one would also swab the bore after firing to make sure there was nothing in the bore for the next load. Then after that was done, the corporal would realign the gun. He would ask for uh, reciting the gun. Number four would move over and he would help sight the, uh, the gun. Then the, the corporal, who was the gunner, he would yell for the load. Number five would move up. He would carry the load up to number two, who would install, hand the load to number two. Number two would place the load into the barrel. Number one would use a rammer, and he would ram the, the charge home. Then they would yell, ready. The gunner would yell, ready. Number two would move out. Number one would move out. If the gun was hot, they would put the rammer and the worm on the, the hubs of the gun to let the infantry know that the gun was a hot gun. Then they would yell, ready again. Our number four would put, pull in, he would put the primer into the primer hole, and uh, then they would fire it. It would take, in, in the Civil War, they could get by with char at least three fires a minute. We don't because they asked us to go one charge for every three minutes because of safety factors. But uh, that's why during the Civil War they had so many uh, blown off hands and arms because it, when the gun was hot, their charges were done with cotton and at the end of the cotton would be a knot. And the knot a lot of times would be on fire or it would be smoldering. And so what they'd do is when they put the other charge down there, that charge would catch on fire and the guy would be ramming it home and he would lose his arm or his hand. So there was a lot of pre-charges in, in the Civil War. Because you gotta imagine if you got 20 guys charging you, you're going to go as fast as you can. Here, I'll show you some of the ammunition. Number one and number two would wear these gloves if they could. If they had the gloves, they'd wear them, because this is what black powder does if you don't have gloves on. It well literally, uh, I did that Sunday, a week ago Sunday. All the precautions and still, huh? These are what they call canisters. This is filled with 27 one-inch balls, and they would fire. It tells you, under, under every ammo chest, it tells you what shot to use. It has a degree for the elevation. Uh, you have a, um, 
you have a sight that hangs on the back. It's got the elevations on it. Here's the... That's what it weighs. That's, that's your... Six pounds. That's a six, but this, this is your uh, canister. This is what they would call a fixed ammo. It's all ready to go. You just put it down the barrel like that. And that's what I was talking about. There's a knot here. Sometimes that knot would be burning. If they put oh, yeah. another load down there, it would catch on fire. Now this one here, this is what they call the exploding shot. This shot here is one that explodes. If you get within so many yards, they would call for a shell. They have fuses. They come in five second fuses. The, huh. the gunner would call for uh, the elevation. The yards would be 1,100 yards. Elevation would be two, two degrees, 2.45 degrees. Time of flight would be three seconds. And the range is 900 yards. So the gunner would yell back and he would yell what he wants. There's two guys back here. They would pull the fuse out of the box. They would cut it to whatever size. They would put it in there. This would go down the barrel. When the gun, gun goes off, it would come around. It would light this time fuse. And if they cut it properly, it would go out two seconds. If they didn't, it would go off sooner or maybe later. Many heroic stories can be told about Civil War battles. Corporal Ricky Townsell shares with us the special heroes who made up Company F. Well, we portray the only black unit from Wisconsin that actually fought in the Civil War. Um, after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, the Bureau of Colored Troops was formed by, uh, by, by the government, and that was the vehicle that they used to allow black uh, colored soldiers, the colored people, to come into the Army. So, uh, in 1864, about 75 black men from Milwaukee went to Quincy, Illinois to join Company F. And the regiment had pretty much been formed all but Company F. So they formed Company F around those 75 men from Milwaukee. One of the most prominent battles that we fought in is called the Battle of the Crater. I don't know if you saw the movie Cold Mountain, but it started off with uh, a scene from that battle. Basically, the plan was um, if the Union could take Richmond, the, uh, the capital of the Confederacy, the war would come to an end. But before they could do that, they had to take Petersburg first. Petersburg put up a very staunch resistance. So it was uh, planned to dig a crater, dig a tunnel rather, underneath the Confederate breastworks, their defenses. They filled that, that tunnel up with dynamite. It was, it was dug by a group of uh, soldiers from Pennsylvania. So they filled it up with, with uh, TNT, with dynamite, and they blew it up. It created a crater. It was about 50 feet deep and uh, maybe 100 feet long. The plan was for the colored troops to go around the perimeter of the trailer, uh, of the, of the uh, crater, and attack the Confederates while they were still in shock and awe. But what happened was um, the two generals, Generals Meade and Burnside, they got into an, an argument over which troop should lead the assault. Uh, Burnside, it was his plan to have the colored troops lead the assault. Meade, who was overall in charge of the, of the Union Army, didn't want the political fallout that could possibly have come about had they all been massacred. Or, and plus there was some concern as to whether or not we would fight. So basically they put a white unit to uh, spearhead the charge. They went down into the crater instead of going around the crater. So needless to say, uh, and then they didn't do it right away. They waited several hours. So the Confederates had gotten over their shock and awe and they got their defenses back together. And they were pretty much waiting. They had every piece of weaponry they had aimed down the curvature of the crater. So when our guys started to come back up again from the other side, they just laid waste. But it was of particular interest to our unit because we ultimately got our chance to go down into the crater. When our regiment went in, we went in with a, uh, 150 soldiers. We came out with roughly 75. Um, and our commander, our uh, regimental commander, our colonel, he was killed in that battle. And it was a, came to a point, there was a narrative that I read, it came to a point that said, uh, we couldn't go back, we couldn't go forward, so our colonel drew a saber and he said, touch up boys, which means get to the ready. He said, today we're gonna show the world that colored men know how to fight. So he led the charge, he was killed. 
And there was another fur further narrative that was written by uh, a correspondent who was on a hill overlooking the battle and he, he saw the battle. And he made mention of the fact that the colored troops actually got to the top of the crater on the other side. And they held the position for a short while before they were overcome by a much larger, larger Confederate force. So uh, it wasn't, it was a bloody day, but it was a good day for the 29th. But that's basically how we came about and what uh, uh, one of the things we involved ourselves in. I guess as a colored troop though, probably the most proudest moment a soldier would have had was at Appomattox Courthouse when General Lee surrendered. He had to walk the line of troops and Company F, 29th Infantry, well the 29th Infantry was there. He had to walk past our troops in order to get into the courthouse and sign the papers of surrender. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on.